When taking time out to visit new and captivating sites around the world, a must-see destination for any avid traveller is the City of London. Vibrant and exhilarating with world-class restaurants, glamorous shopping districts and a nightlife that's positively buzzing with energy and excitement, the British capital offers everything you could possibly hope for in a city and very much more besides. Amongst the glitz and glamour of the city lights, spectacular monuments make for dazzling views wherever you turn. And the breathtaking architecture from centuries gone by is a constant reminder that London was once the epicentre of a vast empire. This portrait of a city will reveal the rich and intriguing heritage of London as we delve into the past to explore some of its most famous attractions. As you'll soon find out, the stunning buildings that dominate the skyline hold many fascinating tales from the Norman conquest of 1066 right through to the monarchs of the present day. And whether you enjoy wandering through delightful parks and gardens, visiting the city's museums, or simply taking in the spectacular views by the end of this journey, you'll be left in no doubt as to why London really has become one of the greatest cities on the globe. London has been a major settlement for almost 2,000 years, ever since it was founded by the Romans in 43 AD. And over the centuries, many different monarchs and architects have made their mark on the city, leaving a wonderful array of buildings, ranging from Gothic cathedrals to the black and white edifices of the Elizabethan era. But we'll begin our exploration of London one of the city's relatively recent architectural treasures, and possibly one of its most iconic attractions. Buckingham Palace has been the official residence of the British monarchy since the 19th century, and millions of people flock here every year to take in the regal surroundings and to catch a glimpse of the royal family. This is, in fact, one of the few working palaces left in the world today, Banquets, dinners and royal ceremonies are still regularly held here, although during the summer months the royal family escape to Scotland, leaving the state rooms open for the public to explore. The original building was constructed in 1703 as a townhouse for the Duke of Buckingham. The structure has changed a great deal since the 18th century. In 1820, King George IV commissioned John Nash, the most famous architect of the age, to transform Buckingham House into a great palace. And after many costly renovations, three new wings were built around a central courtyard, creating a palace truly fit for a king or a queen for that matter. Nash's designs took so long to complete that it wasn't until 1837 Queen Victoria came to the throne, and Buckingham Palace finally became home to the British royal family. And in the square outside the famous east front of the palace, the magnificent Victoria Memorial provides a fitting commemoration to the Queen who once lived here. While the surrounding area bustles with traffic, it's difficult to imagine that the palace was once surrounded by rolling green countryside. But if you head northeast from the Victoria Memorial through St. James's Park, you'll be given a little light relief from the clamour of the city and get a sense of what the area was like many centuries ago. These ornamental gardens were originally marshy water meadows until King Charles II redesigned the area. From the carefully tended flower beds and tree-lined avenues to the romantic lakeside, the park provides a pleasant retreat right in the very heart of the city. But with so much more to see, it's best not to pause here for too long. 
If you take a short walk to the southwest of the park, you'll find another building, which plays a very significant role in the history of the British monarchy. Every stone and statue of Westminster Abbey is seeped in tales of the past, and its origins date right back to the 10th century, when Benedictine monks first came to the site. In around 1050, one of the last Anglo-Saxon kings of England, Edward the Confessor, built a stone abbey here, which was to stand next to a royal palace he'd constructed on the River Thames. Although King Edward's abbey didn't survive the test of time, the magnificent medieval building that you can see today was constructed by King Henry III in the 13th century as a shrine to honour the earlier Saxon king. King Henry's choice of Anglo-French Gothic style has now made this one of the most important Gothic buildings in the country. And the spectacular structure has been the setting for royal coronations for almost a thousand years. Within, you can find the tombs of many legendary royals, including the Tudor queens, Mary I, and her half-sister, Elizabeth I. Poets' Corner, meanwhile, is a wonderfully sacred area where Britain's greatest writers are commemorated, from William Shakespeare to Charles Dickens. If you venture to the east of the Abbey, you'll also find that although Edward the Confessor's adjoining royal residence didn't survive the test of time, a magnificent palace still stands on this site and the Kings of England chose this location as their official residence right up until the 16th century. Today, Westminster Palace plays a very significant role in Great Britain as the seat of the British government. Indeed, politicians have gathered here since 1295, when the first official Parliament of England met. The palace is now also known as the Houses of Parliament, and there can be no doubt that many great historical events have taken place here, which have played an important part in shaping the British nation. Westminster Palace is certainly a breathtaking sight. And although few vestiges of the original medieval structure remain, the mock Gothic architecture, designed by Sir Charles Barry in Victorian times, has created a truly impressive building. If you're keen to seek out the remnants of the ancient palace, however, you'll find the crypt of St Stephen's Chapel has survived the fires of centuries gone by, and the Jewel Tower, which was built to house the jewels of King Edward III in the 14th century, is fascinating to explore. Of course, any visitor to the Houses of Parliament will also be keen to see one of the world's most famous clock towers, which stands on the northern end of the building. This is unrivaled as the largest clock in Britain, and the deep chimes of the giant bell housed within, affectionately known as Big Ben, after the Chief Commissioner of Works at the time of its construction, has become a symbol of Britain across the globe. As we take in our last views of Westminster, it's now time to move north and really step back in time as we visit an edifice constructed by the Normans after their invasion of England in 1066. The Tower of London is one of the most evocative and fascinating of all London's landmarks. It began its days as an impressive fortress to protect the city from further invasion, and indeed to protect the Normans from the native English. William the Conqueror ordered its construction in 1078 to symbolise his power, and it certainly became an imposing structure along the river, warning the English that the Normans were here to stay. As years went by, the ever-expanding tower was used as a royal palace, and if you have time to explore inside, you'll find a fascinating array of rooms and such well-known treasures as the crown jewels. In the 16th century, however, during the reign of Henry VIII, the Tower of London was to become a sinister prison, synonymous with terror. 
torture and death. Two of the king's wives were beheaded here, and many of the 50,000 people he condemned to death during his reign were sent from the tower to be executed outside, creating a ghoulish spectacle for onlookers. You can still see the chilling traitor's gate where prisoners entered the tower from the river, but you'll find that nowadays people are more likely to use the nearby bridge to reach the Tower of London. Tower Bridge was built at the end of the 19th century, and although it doesn't have the rich history of its impressive neighbour, it has nevertheless become another iconic symbol of the British capital. If you have a good head for heights, the catwalk joining the two towers is open to the public, and the beautiful views down the Thames are truly spectacular. But to get an even better view of the city, you'll find that London can easily accommodate your needs. To the south of Tower Bridge, you'll find the London Eye, which at 135 metres is one of the world's tallest observation wheels. This really is a miracle of modern engineering, even by 21st century standards, and the views afforded by the spacious capsules are quite literally breathtaking, and whatever the weather, the experience is always rewarding. It's now time to discover a little of what London's museums and galleries have to offer find an abundance of fabulous cultural institutions scattered throughout the capital. From the vast collections at the British Museum in Bloomsbury to the delightful Sherlock Holmes Museum on Baker Street, there are plenty of fascinating sites where you can dip into various aspects of British heritage. Many cultural treasures have been gathered in the capital over the centuries, and in the next step of our journey we'll head to South Kensington where we can delve into some of the most impressive museums London has to offer. Kensington is without doubt one of London's most expensive and affluent areas. It's easy to understand why Queen Victoria's consort, Prince Albert, chose this district to create a new museum complex for the city in the 19th century. Albert took an active interest in the arts, science, trade and industry and used the profits from the Great Exhibition of 1851 to help establish a fabulous array of cultural and educational institutions here. One of the most popular museums to be found in South Kensington today is the Natural History Museum. This vast cathedral-like building is in itself an architectural masterpiece. And the relief sculptures and statues that decorate the exterior reveal many of the living and extinct species that can be found within. The museum is also a world-renowned centre for research, boasting a staggering 70 million specimens within its five main collections. And there are many incredible exhibits for the public to enjoy, revealing displays from prehistory right through to modern day life on Earth. When you've experienced the splendours of nature, the achievements of the human race await in the Science Museum next door, and from medicine to space travel, children and adults alike will find plenty to entertain them here. Finally, a visit to the Victoria and Albert Museum just across the road will not disappoint. This was founded in 1852 as the Museum of Manufactures to inspire the design students of the day. It is now the world's largest museum of decorative arts. It houses a permanent collection of over four and a half million objects spanning over 5,000 years of art and its rooms and corridors are filled with ancient treasures, artwork and statues, and a breathtaking collection of artefacts. The name of the museum was actually changed by Queen Victoria in memory of her beloved husband, who suddenly died of typhoid in 1861 
at the age of 42. And as we leave the complex he created so many years ago and venture into Kensington Gardens, you'll realise how very much the Queen was affected by the loss of her Prince Consort. At the top of Exhibition Road, you'll find it hard to miss the extraordinary gold-gilded Royal Albert Memorial towering above the trees. And if scale and grandeur indicate the depth of Victoria's sense of loss, then it'll come as no surprise that she never fully recovered from her husband's death. Completed in 1876, this medieval-looking shrine boasts a Gothic revival spire adorned with angels, while beneath a gilded bronze statue of the prince sits contemplating his surroundings. Meanwhile, elegant marble sculptures representing the four continents stand on the platform below. Prince Albert is not the only member of British royalty to be celebrated in Kensington Gardens. And if you head deeper into the park, towards the Serpentine River, you'll find a site of more recent royal mourning. The Princess of Wales Memorial Fountain is a touching tribute to Princess Diana, who died in 1997 and the flowing water with calm pools, combined with the wonderful views across the river, create a truly extraordinary atmosphere. Designed to reflect the princess's life and her fondly remembered qualities, the fountain is a place where visitors can remember Diana and enjoy a little peace and tranquility far from the hustle and bustle of London's busy streets. To the west of the memorial, you can find another location which is relevant to Diana's life. The princess occupied apartments in the west wing of Kensington Palace for 16 years, and this stately house has indeed been the residence of many famous royals such as Queen Victoria, who was born and raised here. Kensington Gardens were, in days gone by, the palace grounds, and today you can still see many charming features, such as the Italian garden at the head of the Serpentine, which serve as a reminder of its regal past. But now it's time to leave the pleasant surroundings of London's parkland and head back into the bustling city centre, where we'll find another of the British capital's most iconic buildings. The small area within Greater London, known as the City, is the historic core of London, where the original Roman settlement of Londinium built. Today, the Square Mile, as it's also known, has become a major business and financial centre, and the area is dominated by banks and stylish modern office blocks. But although there are sadly few remnants of ancient architecture here, you'll find that one building in particular still provides a real reminder of the past. The magnificent St Paul's Cathedral was restored to glory by the architect Sir Christopher Wren after the Great Fire of London, which destroyed 80% of the city in 1666. There has, in fact, been a church on this site since 604 AD, but the present building is considered to be the fourth St Paul's Cathedral and is undoubtedly the most spectacular of all. When Wren was commissioned to rebuild St Paul's, he came up with a daring new design that met considerable resistance from the conservative church authorities, who insisted the plan was simplified. However, the architect was a determined character, and although the final design wasn't quite as grand as Wren had hoped, the cathedral he created has certainly made its mark on the city. The last stone was placed high up on the lantern on Wren's 76th birthday in 1708. And ever since its completion, St Paul's has become synonymous with the resilience of the British capital, which has survived the ravages of war and fire over hundreds of years. From St Paul's, 
couldn't be in a better position to see an area of the city where modern design and ancient architecture sit so comfortably side by side. Across the river is the Tate Modern, where since the year 2000, the National Collection of Modern Art, dating from the 20th century onwards, has been housed. This once fully operational power station was designed by Sir Giles Gilbert Scott, the architect best known for creating Great Britain's iconic red telephone boxes. But as it became surplus to requirements in the 1980s, the building was eventually renovated and now houses Britain's largest collection of modern art. Often controversial and always thought-provoking, the exhibits in the Tate Modern are guaranteed to be a talking point, as is the building in which they are housed. Next door to the Tate, you can find a new addition to the buildings gracing the river, inspired by one of the oldest and most famous of London's entertainment emporiums, the William Shakespeare Globe Theatre. First erected in 1599, the original Globe Theatre was built by Shakespeare and his acting troupe, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, and provided the stage for many of the famous dramatist's greatest plays. Today, you can relive the experience of the Elizabethan era within its walls, but if you prefer something a little more modern, you'll need to head for London's West End. At night, London comes alive to reveal a whole new side to its persona, and for theatregoers, the choice on offer is without rival. From Shaftesbury Avenue to Piccadilly, there are a whole host of theatres and shows on offer with everything available, from musical extravaganza to serious drama. If, of course, you prefer a less expensive form of entertainment, you can always visit Covent Garden, where you can often see performances in the central market area that are often as captivating as those on the stage. Whatever show you choose, what better way could there be to end the evening than a meal in one of the city's many restaurants? Where you'll find that London's richly deserved reputation for food is as good as anywhere in the world. From quiet cafes and busy restaurants to the unique area known as Chinatown and the lively atmosphere of Leicester Square, there's always somewhere to enjoy fine food, whether a quiet dinner for two or a night out with a group of friends. Sadly, our tour of London's best-loved landmarks is now drawing to a close. It's time to explore our final destination. You'll find that whether it's night or day, Trafalgar Square is the perfect place to soak up the atmosphere of the British capital. The square commemorates the Battle of Trafalgar, when Napoleon and the French were beaten at sea by Lord Nelson, who was killed aboard his flagship, the Victory find it hard to miss the statue of the famous Vice Admiral overlooking the square on top of his 165 foot high column. And since its construction, the monument has become one of the city's most treasured structures. At the base, you'll find four magnificent lion statues standing guard, which were created by Queen Victoria's favourite artist, Edward Landseer. And here, taking in our last views of Trafalgar Square, we really do reach the end of our journey. As I'm sure you'll agree, the pleasures of London and the amazing sights make this a truly magnificent capital city. There is something here to enlighten and entertain everyone. From palaces and parks, to museums and modern landmarks, there are so many unique treasures just waiting to be discovered. London has evolved, surviving to rise phoenix-like from the ashes on so many occasions. If you take the time to explore its most intriguing haunts, you'll realise why this is one city that really does deserve the title Great. <laughs>